people that don't know what this group is. And I think many people don't. They may know the parties that Kaluna Irada works with. I think they know the purpose, the beliefs, the goals, but just a general summary of what this group is to somebody who doesn't know Kaluna Irada. So Kaluna Irada is an advocacy group that is working towards political change in Lebanon. It's a huge title, obviously. Well, that's all you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> one sentence could be so destructive for one goal, you know? <laughs> um, but yes, so this is, this is the general mission. This is a group that is formed and funded exclusively by Lebanese, mm. both in Lebanon and in the diaspora. These are people that still believe in the country and that still think that something can be done and that want to give it a real shot with real capabilities and leveraging, um, leveraging basically the resources that we have in terms of policy development, in terms of networking with the diaspora, even in terms of fundraising capacity. Yeah. And in terms of networking within the uh, political landscape in Lebanon and supporting opposition groups that have emerged. Now, I know the name prior to the revolution, prior to October 17th. So I remember this, seeing the name online. So I'm guessing that the, the goals were set out before the protest movement began. True. And have they, have they been, in a way, has there been any modification? Because I can only imagine that now the task is so big and the groups you have to speak to, they're so large in numbers. Uh, is it simply just generating money and spending that money accordingly or is there something bigger at play? Because the reason I'm asking it this way, it seems like this is the final chance to get things right. And I can't imagine that's what Kulona Irada saw at the beginning when it first set up it itself. I'm guessing the the objective is so much bigger now than it was three years ago. So, in a way, how has Kaluna Irada kept up with everything that's happening? I mean, yes, the, the, basically the approach has changed over time. Mm. It, it was modified according to the landscape, to the recent developments. And yes, partially, uh, before October 17, you had this lobbyist approach. Mm. So you'd go and you'd pick the nice guys in the political parties, and then you'd convince them that uh, this is how you should reform the energy sector, right. this is how yeah. you should reform the water sector, and I don't know what. But I mean, of course, this approach has proved its limitations. Today, Kuluna Irada sincerely believes that there's nothing good that's going to come out of this clan of six political parties who are in power, the six main political parties, of course, and their satellites. And we also believe that there is no other way but to support and partner with opposition groups mm. and individuals who really want to build something different in the country. So it really was the beginning trying to get the regime to reform. Yes, exactly. Or so we moved from a reformist uh, perspective to one of opposition and building an alternative to this uh, regime. Now, I'm, I'm sorry to go a little further, but I'm mm. always curious about this. Has a group like Kaluna Irada completely let go of any potential reform within the current establishment? And the reason I ask is you do see certain political parties that are trying to position themselves that way. And they tend to be the parties that take up a lot of the conversation. So I, I spoke a few weeks ago to Sami Jmeir from Kata'ib. He sees himself as opposition. Mm. Does Kaluna Irada see someone like him maybe capable of reform, but it's not necessarily a group you need to focus mm. on? Because I'm wondering if there's a deliberate policy to let that kind of person reform if they want to, but focus solely on the opposition groups. Mm. So in other words, it's, a, it's almost like a uh, deliberate choice to let those parties handle it but you're going to focus your energy on the ones that are not one of the six that you mentioned. 
we're not uh, a political party, so we're not ideological in that mm. sense. If there are groups in the opposition and in the landscape who want to work with, ally with uh, groups like Sami Jmail, it's not up to us to to actually say whether these are a real, quote-unquote, opposition right. or not. What we do on our end is Kuluna Irada has its own guiding principles, okay? Mm, mm. They're very high-level guiding principle, but for us, these are the principles according to which we decide whether to engage or not engage with any group. And uh, they're pretty simple. So the first is this group has to really admit and acknowledge that there's a problem of sovereignty in this country and that, and that reclaiming this is part of reclaiming the state. The second is the group has to the group or the individual has to acknowledge that we have a pro, we have an economic problem in the country right. and that it's systemic and that we need an economic model that is more just. So basically, people who talk the entire day about Hezbollah but who have never mentioned the banks for the past two yeah. years, not interested in engaging. And last but not least, we believe that we want to reclaim our civic state back. So civic state, secular state, call it what you want, but we believe that we need to reclaim the state and we believe that the constitution today provides the foundations, maybe not necessarily the end point, but the foundation for us to start claiming back the state. So we believe in today's constitution as a solid starting point. It's refreshing to hear someone in this sphere, and I mean, the community is not that big in Lebanon. We know most of these people. But the civil society uh, lot, it is refreshing to hear you say sovereignty first and foremost as one of the three main guiding principles. I think that is a, uh, that may be a belated issue that is finally being addressed. And I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that coupled with the just problems that everyone is facing, primarily economic dignity and uh, the goals that you set out, which is real civic engagement, trying to build a real, a, a reformed and just state. But going down the sovereignty road, since you brought that up, and I'm glad you did, in your mind, somebody who's been involved in, in the opposition for quite some time, do you sense that this is a goal that is maybe brought up a little too late in the, in the dialogue? Because I hear it now being discussed there's no, um, there's no fear in discussing it now, but I got the feeling that years ago there was genuine fear at mm. maybe making this a polarizing issue, and now it's mm. a guiding principle. Mm. So is there any reflection there in your, in your own, maybe your own career in this world? Do you think that it's a little late, or do you think it's actually, no, now is the time to, to tackle this? And I'm sorry to put such a big question on you, but... Iran's foreign minister is here today. Yes. Uh, I don't think that is being discussed in a way that's fruitful. It's more that, well, there's nothing we can do about this. Mm. Let the regime handle it. And they did in a very sort of, uh, in a very, uh, I don't know what the word is. It's almost like they ignored the whole problem of sovereignty when Iran's foreign minister is visiting Lebanon. Yes. But you're saying it as a first principle. Mm. So maybe it's a sloppy question, but do you think it is the role now of civil society to tackle this head on without worry about whether or not this is polarizing. I think the importance is to tackle this along with other issues that are part of the problem. Uh, if you only focus on this problem, then uh, for me at least, yeah. groups lose part of their credibility. But mm -hmm. of course, I mean, it's very obvious. And the Secretary General of Hezbollah bluntly came three days after the beginning of the revolution and positioned himself against October 17, against yep. the people that went to the streets, that took to the streets, and clearly showed that Hezbollah is going to defend this regime no matter what it takes, even if it's at the cost of people's misery. Even, the, and when we say this regime, even entities that, or parties that were um, Hezbollah's enemies, if you want, or opponents, political right. opponents. Yes. I mean, it, it's so obvious today, it's undeniable, Hezbollah is the strongest political party, Hezbollah is protecting the entire regime and ensuring its survival, 
at the expense of the Lebanese. And this is undeniable. And after August 4th, it became even more difficult to ignore this or not to tackle it up front. It's good to hear this being tackled, at least on Kaluna Irada's side. Um, in a way, that issue has, I think, infected every aspect of political reform. And what I like about Kaluna Irada is that it's user-friendly. I can go to the website and just read on very detailed, well-written statements, position papers, opinions in a way that are turned into policy, and it's very easy to access. So someone like me can learn from Kaluna Irada and can also see just how systemic problems are, whether it's through Hezbollah or other actors. So we can bring up, if you'd like, the most recent uh, piece and it's almost a, it's a call to action, if you will, on getting Lebanese, mostly abroad, to email their ambassadors. Now, I, I think that is, uh, it's very easy to do so, and mm -hmm. I think I like the way it's set up on the website. Yeah. But my understanding is this stems from an earlier piece that was written, I think it's early September, about the six seats yeah. in parliament that are being allotted to the diaspora, as opposed to the 128 seats that all of us are entitled to. So maybe we can bridge those two pieces together. I'm going to title them. The first one is Same Nationality, Same Rights. And the second one, which came out, and I have the date here, 5th of September, uh, Diaspora Participation in Lebanon's 2022, 2022 elections, canceling the six expats seats. I think it's today, it was officially, or maybe yesterday, that March is now the election March mm -hmm. 7, is that right? March, March 27. Uh, March 27, sorry. Yes. So it's been pretty much determined. Mm. I can imagine the six seats will also be determined on their terms as well. So where does Kaluna Irada stand and what can you do? In face of the regime that's trying to do whatever it can to sideline the voice of the diaspora, what we can do is at least raise the voice of the diaspora as mm. much as possible. Mm. And, and this is why uh, we actually launched uh, this campaign with other partners in order to say that the peop people have at least the right to email their ambassadors and to ask that they be allowed to, vo to vote across 128 seats and not to be boxed in six seats that are dedicated to the diaspora. And that, I mean, according to criteria that are still unclear now, we still don't know until the moment how these six seats will be divided or, or how the diaspora will vote according to these six seats. And what's very interesting is that we won't know until the registration window for the diaspora closes. So registration for the diaspora right. to be able to vote outside of Lebanon is now open, yes. and the window closes on November 20th. We will not, we do not know now and will not know before November 20th whether the, go, the, the establishment basically will allow the diaspora to vote across the 128 seats as, as happened in 2018 right. or yeah. box them into six diaspora dedicated seats or cancel the diaspora vote altogether under the pretext that it's logistically and financially, I mean, oh, uh, very tough being, to pull off. Is that being discussed on? Yes, this is oh, also on the table. Okay. So we won't know. Um, so what, what we're actually encouraging the diaspora do, to do today is, if they are sure that they won't be able to be in Lebanon for the elections, then register abroad. But if you think you can make it here, then do not register. And in the meantime, mm. keep on pressuring through your embassies for your right to vote equally as the Lebanese who are residing in Lebanon to vote across all 128. I'm sorry if this is a stupid question, but I saw that in the, in the piece as well that do not register if you know that you'll be here. Yes. But is there a concern there that if you register, you are, is there a disadvantage to registering and then coming here? I'm if you register abroad, yeah. you can't vote in Lebanon. Anymore. Right, so there's, it cancels your ability to vote here? Yes. I see, I didn't know that. Yes. So th the reason I like this, uh, this, the 5th September piece on, on the six seats is that you bring up the issue of universal suffrage. In exactly. a way, it's almost like Lebanon is not asking, you are not asking for more than the basics here, which is Lebanese should have the right to vote, period. And where did the six seat 
idea even originate from? Because it kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, the concept exists. I mean, in France you have this, for mm. instance, but you have it in countries where, as a diaspora, I mean, if I'm French and I travel abroad for work, I register, my government knows um, that I am over there, my MP acts right. as a link between me and my country of origin, uh, they provide me with different kinds of services, etc. Yeah. Whereas in Lebanon, we all know that this is not going to be the case. In Lebanon, this is just an attempt to box the diaspora vote. Uh, and, and this is why we should insist on the diaspora being able to vote across 128 uh, and peace. So asking the Lebanese public, citizens, primarily in the diaspora, to make this an issue, does Kaluna Irada have any communication with the regime on these issues? Yes, pressuring. Okay. So, so we, of course, want to pressure parliament because, I mean, if you want to cancel the six seats mm. and revert back to the voting system that was in 2018, then you're going to have to amend the, the current electoral law. So we're going to pressure parliamentarians in order to amend the current electoral law. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but how does how would a group like Kaluna Irada do that? I'm trying to imagine why they would listen if they don't listen to experts by default. Yes. I'm sorry to be so like straightforward yes, in this, because but, because we yeah. we leverage the public pressure tool. Right. This right. is what we're leveraging now in our diaspora campaign, and this mm. is what we're going to leverage uh, later on locally. Yeah. We're going to engage with different stakeholders, with, with like-minded with, with like organizations, with opposition groups, with the public at large, in order to increase pressure on parliamentarians if need be. So the real goal is lobbying here, in that sense. You're lobbying the public to up the ante, and you're also pressuring the regime, which I think is a huge task. Yeah. Do you sense that the Lebanese are on the same page and I'm sorry to be a bit blunt here, but mm. the momentum that I've seen and probably all of us have experienced has been one of disinterest. So I'll give you an example. Ever since the Najib Miati government was formed, it almost feels like we know that they're not going to leave next election. That, In other words... The momentum since October 17, 2019, for a complete overhaul, and mm. now the de facto situation. The counter-revolution. Right. <laughs> this, this is a counter-revolution by the regime. So uh, do you think that the appetite is still there to see ambitious goals like this played out? I mean, how do you measure appetite, right? <laughs> That's so true. Well, we're both hungry. If it's, <laughs> <laughs> if, it's, if it's by the number of people on the streets, mm. Uh, definitely the opposition will be unable to maintain a consistent number of people on the streets for two years. Yeah, of course. It, it's actually impressive that uh, this number has been maintained for, for quite a long while. I mean, yeah. it's, it's already impressive. But look, um, I mean, remember the 4th of August this year. The number of people on the streets was huge. Yeah. People are still enraged. People still want to see this regime fall down, but people cannot sustain staying on the streets. Yeah. And we all know that the economic situation is very tough. Yeah. And I mean, people cannot afford it, basically. They cannot afford to stay on the streets. Yeah. I'm confident that um, demand for change exists. I think the real challenge is how to translate this into the ballot boxes. And this is where... Mm. The opposition has to work very hard on creating a cred credible alternative for people. It's, it's one thing for you as an opposition to, I mean, uh, portray yourself as uh, credible, honest, etc. And it's another a totally different ball game to actually convince people to vote for you on election day. And this is what the opposition should focus on right now. So it's still on, in a way, engagement. And it's, mm. it's real civic engagement here, that you're making these grassroots parties seem more acceptable politically. And does that require an entirely unified front? And the reason I ask this cliche question is I've seen the opposition splinter and splinter and splinter, 
into what is just uh, endless splintering. And sometimes I know this is, can be personality driven. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily principles. You could all share the same principles. Mm. Or maybe to a degree you share them and then you have egos that get in the way and that's familiar terrain here. Does it have to be that unified to win? Because I, I hear that all the time mm. and I hear that that's a precondition to winning. But I'm not sure if that's a, is that a necessity? So that the numbers do match the desires of people wanting change. Because I can't imagine everyone sort of coming back now to a unified front. And I, I don't want to sound too pessimistic here, but I don't think anyone can make that happen. So tell me if I'm wrong, because I'd like to hear that I'm wrong on this, and whether or not complete unity is necessary. I think political clarity is necessary. Mm. And if there, I think October 17 achieved a lot. Mm. There was a societal change. Um, the youth, the women, um, the, the new opposition groups that emerged. So, so really, there were lots of shifts post-October 17. But one key thing that I would have hoped for that hasn't materialized yet is a very clear and solid political discourse that groups not necessarily all groups, but mm. that a substantial amount of groups are able to coalesce around and that people are able to own our discourse until today. I mean, is, it, it's a good discourse. There's a, there's a lot of good elements that have been developed in this discourse. But someone like my father or my mother will never feel that, like they own this discourse and like mm. they can convince others of it. And I think this is the real challenge. What I was hoping for is after this October 17 moment for us to be able really to put a new discourse on the table and to have the widest number of groups possible coalesce around it. And I really don't care if, um, if uh, w one of these groups uh, two years ago was allied to someone else mm -hmm. or whether yeah. one of these groups uh, was in power five years ago. Yeah. I really don't care. If we really want a shift and if we want a shift that will create a balance of power, mm. then we want people to join forces. I mean, we cannot expect that the same group of, of people are going to create this balance of power. We're going to need more and more people to join this and to adhere by this discourse. And this we haven't achieved yet. Now, going back to the elections, um, I'm hoping that the major groups and main individuals in the opposition are pragmatic enough to achieve um, a satisfactory level of coordination according to clear political principles. And may, this is not impossible. Well, may I ask these principles, and I like that you're outlining it in a, in a really accessible way. Is it going back to the three issues that you brought up at the beginning? Yes, of course. So, so are, those are the principles that... I mean, yes, these for me are very important mm. parts of parts of this principle. What does the state look like? What, is the state, what does the state that we want to live in look like? Mm. Uh, how can we reclaim the state's sovereignty? And how can we build a new economic model that is more just for all? I think these are big questions. These are the questions that people want to be answered, but answered in a convincing way mm. that doesn't actually, I mean, <laughs> that doesn't actually um, presuppose that people are uh, are non-sectarian or that people uh, are uh, are not racist or that people no we should understand that if we want to talk to people we should understand who the people that we are talking to are and i don't want to speak on your behalf but i'm hearing this debate around secularism and sectarianism not in a bad way more mm. like confessional power sharing versus a completely secular mm. system. Is that the issue that you're touching on? It's one of the issues. Mm. Yes, of okay. course. Yeah. Uh, what does the state that we want to live in look like? Yeah. And um, how do we actually uh, address the fears of a big part of the population mm -hmm. that, uh, that wants to protect 
its identity and that feels that, that its identity is under threat? How do we address other fears that the population has? How do we address the concerns of, uh, of the middle class that feels that it is going away completely yeah. and that it's losing all, all its means of uh, survival? How do we address the concerns of, of the poor that feel that if they are not aligned with any of the six uh, major sectarian parties, then they have no access to anything, nor to healthcare, nor to education? I think the basis of the discourse should, yes, be according to these three guidelines and should mainly focus on the fact that we need to create a state that treats every person equally, that provides equal opportunities to everyone, and that protects everyone and respects people's rights. And, and this idea of building a modern state that provides and protects everyone um, is really powerful. We should work on it, we should develop it, and we should use it to counter today the fear discourse that is promoted by the sectarian parties. Let's say that that is already a huge task. And then you add to that massive undertaking the catastrophe that is August 4. Yes. And not just the blast, which is what the issue is all about, but the pushback against the investigation, the so far unwillingness to see an international investigation uh, take shape, and this small local investigation getting, uh, I mean, being slapped around so much mm. <laughs> to the point that the fact that taught it be taught is still around as an achievement. <laughs> yes, true. And that you have these MPs or former ministers who we all know trying to sort of find a way to get immunity and maybe they're doing it for other reasons too, but that it's a, it's a dance. And it's the dance the regime does so well. And then you have a group like Kaluna Irada. So I know that there's been a position paper issued and it actually it was a reflection or it was a reminder, not a reflection, a reminder of a I think it was the Human Rights Council piece published in June. It's Human Rights Watch, yes. It's Human Rights Watch, sorry, yes, sorry. Uh, Human Rights Watch, Human Rights Council sounds like Star Wars almost. Human, yeah, Human yeah. Rights Watch uh, from June, and then it's adding to that the urgency needed for this investigation to work. Mm -hmm. Does Kaluna Irada have the ability to lobby that? Wouldn't that require the Lebanese state and its very defective way to still make that a, a, a policy. And the reason I ask is, the only other example I can think of is the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, mm. which was still a state-mandated mm -hmm. tribunal. This one so far, there seems to be no interest for the state to go that road, let alone to let a local one happen. So how, how does Kaluna Irada even begin to address this? Uh, just to clarify, so this is a demand um, that Human Rights Watch, along with other international organizations, mm -hmm. along with Kuluna Irada and other local organizations have issued, to demand from the Human Rights Council an independent investigative mission. And this independent investigative mission can support a local, the local yeah. investigation. Right. Okay. Um, and this is not the only route uh, that we are exploring. This is one route. Mm. Another route is public pressure in Lebanon, definitely. So everything that, um, that we have seen happening regarding Judge Tari Bitar, um, supporting the families of the victims yeah. and everything that they are doing in Lebanon. So that's another route. A third route is you already have uh, legal cases that were filed by, uh, by Lebanese nationals who hold a dual nationality uh, outside of Lebanon uh, demanding justice regarding the August 4 blast. And this right. is also one track that um, we are pursuing and that we are following up on. There's another track also, which is today the investigation that is happening regarding Savaro. Yes. in the UK, and yeah. other investigations yeah. regarding other companies mm. that were involved in this entire fiasco. Yeah. So we are following up on several tracks, on several parallel tracks, and we think it's important uh, not only to, um, to continue pressure locally, but also internationally. 
because we realize that this regime is capable of anything. We have seen this regime do whatever it wants and get away with it. So uh, this, is, this is an option that is, of course, on the table in the case of the August 4th blast, and this is why we are pursuing multiple and parallel tracks. As much as you can say on those multiple and parallel tracks, because I know that, that tends, that's the language that's used, but when it comes to the actual capabilities of any group to address this, what does that imply? Is it simply a, you want Lebanese abroad to sue the state? Lebanese who are here during the blast and who are victims of the blast are already suing the state abroad. And we're following up on this legal action. So it's supporting those citizens yes. that take it upon themselves yes. to do it. So Kaluna Irada does reach out to Lebanese abroad on those issues too? Yes, of course. Okay, so it's not just opposition parties here pursuing elections. No. It's Lebanese abroad pursuing justice. Yes, a lot of advocacy work. Mm. And one of the main issues today that, that we're focusing on is accountability post-August 4 blasts. Right. Is there anything you can add to this? Because I don't hear much about it. Have there been any successful lawsuits filed? I mean, the, the Savaro, there's a lot of progress on the Savaro case. Mm. Uh, and there's, there's also the possibility of um, opening new uh, legal cases mm, against mm. other companies, and this is also underway. So there is progress on that end. Yeah. Of course, this entire topic is uh, very sensitive. Uh, so I think a it's lot probably of, the most sensitive, yes. right? Of the, so yeah. a lot of information remains confidential until mm, the moment. Mm, but I can mm. tell you for a fact that there is legal action that is being pursued, and there is progress uh, there. Now, the extent to which we're going to reach a result, is, I mean. No, but I'm glad, you're, I'm, I'm glad you're being honest about it, too. So there is the built-in caution. Yes, of course. Yeah. But also, I mean, other than the built-in caution, I mean, do we really need an investigation? Do we not know who politically is responsible for this? An investigation is needed to point the finger. But, I mean, do we really need one? Do we not know who is responsible for this? I want to ask, you know what, I'm, since you're bringing it up, and I'm glad you are, I'd like to go down this road a little further with you. And I'm glad that you're able to talk about it on your terms as well. Um, this is actually what attracts me to a group like Kaluna Irada, which is standing firm despite public opinion or despite even pressure. So I respect this. I agree with you. You don't need an investigation to point at the obvious, uh, the obvious machine that's involved in, ha- in having Lebanon host 2,700 tons of weapons-grade ammonium nitrate. There's no need for that. I think logic will guide you in the right direction. But there's the advantage, I think, of what we're seeing now on the streets that has less to do, I think, with August 4, more to do with facts over fiction. The, the big advantage of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon is not its cost. It's not that it cost a lot of money. It's not that it was sluggish and maybe emotionally extremely disappointing or that only one name emerges at the end. It's that we know that that one name is somebody involved in one group, one militia in Lebanon, and that's a case closed. We can now say with full confidence, unless you buy into conspiracies, that there is one group responsible for that event. I think that gives the tools necessary to actually keep pointing in the right direction and saying that we know who did it. There's no need to imagine another scenario. That is one advantage I think that is helpful in having an investigation. And it puts the bad guys under pressure, which may not be a bad thing. But I agree with the sentiment. You don't need an investigation at this point to let your brain guide you in the right direction. I would still like to see an investigation happen. Yes, of course. Yeah. But, but I mean, I think we can all say that this regime has been at best, careless and, and irresponsible and corrupt, mm. and at worst, complicit in, yeah. kill, in, yeah. in, in, in destroying half of the city and, and killing 200 people. So this is clear. Mm. Now, who specifically and how it was done, I mean, of course, the details are necessary. Accountability is very important. But I think politically, people have already determined that this regime is a culprit, um, it's very obvious today that there's a standoff. There's us, the people, 
against this regime. It's clear. You can see it. You can see it in August 4. You can see it after that. You can see it in, 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 in people's attitudes towards this regime today. I think this is the biggest challenge of our time because that issue revolves around everything. It, it is an issue of sovereignty. It is an issue of ending impunity. True. It's an issue of ending immunity as well where it's illegal. And it's obviously not Kulluna Irada's responsibility. This is the Lebanese state at the end of the day. Whether or not it delivers a just state at the end is a huge undertaking. And I admire the effort that it that, And I admire the pursuit that people in any group are willing to keep pushing because this is a very, it's such a hard task. But then I'd like to take it into the opposition parties because they're the future or at least that's what I assume they are. They're the future voices trying to enter power. I know that Kaluna Irada and other groups as well speak to all of these grassroots mm. movement parties. I, and from Mintashreen to Lihaqqi to any group that has emerged since October 17. So you have these parties and then you have the status quo and you want them to win seats in next year's elections. Let's say a sizable number of these individuals enter parliament. Let's go crazy. Let's say 20 new faces emerge in parliament. I mean, I'm really like, you know, going yeah. all the way here. They enter a parliament that is not, uh, they enter a regime that is not designed for people like them. Mm-hmm. We've had elections before where reform-minded people entered parliament yes. and they got nowhere. And if they tried, if they tried to really pursue reform, they were either, I mean, intimidated to the point that they stopped or some of them were killed. And this is going all the way with the three issues you were, you were describing. So what makes this round different? Let's assume you have the same kind of aspirations. You enter the system my guess is that they will face the same problems. Which makes me then wonder, is it possible to tackle political reform or to even go down the road of civic engagement so long as that one issue, which is sovereignty, is not dealt with? And I know that Kaluna Irada cannot fix Lebanon's sovereign problems. That is a geopolitical problem, and it's an old problem. But why is there any expectation that this round is different? We're both, we're both old enough to know 2005 and 2009. There were election victories mm -hmm. for reform-minded individuals, maybe not all of them, but some of them. Those voices were diminished long ago. So why is Mintashreen different? Or why is any group different this round? I think it would be naive to believe that we can change the system or even reform it if we get 20 people into parliament. There were other instances where there was a majority in parliament, but that majority has not ruled, actually. Right. This is, um, this is a regime that takes its legitimacy not from the democratic institution, but that takes right. its legitimacy outside of these institutions. Yes. One, from a sectarian power-sharing system, the legitimacy of Mr. Walid Jumblat is not because he has five people in parliament or even 20. <laughs> the legitimacy is that he protects the Druze. <laughs> and, 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 of course, all of these sectarian leaders together give each other legitimacy because they agree on this power-sharing system and they work on sustaining it. I think what we will have to expect out of the parliamentary elections and what we're aiming for is for uh, someone like Gibran Basile to stop saying that he represents 70% of the Christians and for, so, mm. and for the Shiite mm. duo mm. to be unable to say anymore that they have monopoly over all of the Shias in Lebanon or for other, um, I mean, other leaders to still claim that they have the legitimacy that they had before. So what we're aiming for this time is to continue in this power struggle, to be able to add another milestone uh, to this face-off with this, with this regime, and to at least help 
in creating new for forces that have legitimacy, that have the legitimacy of having gained 2,000, 3,000, 10,000 votes in the elections. And this is important in itself, and it, it will help us build even more for later. So it's really about reinvigorating the institutions within a very limited space. Okay? Yes, the space is limited, of course. Right. So it's, so it's I, I'm hearing this from you, that it's really about delegitimizing the old guard. Sort of making sure that they to don't the have... To the extent possible, of course. To the extent possible, yes, yeah. Yes, of course. Now, that's, that's the regime that has been entrenched for so long. Yes. Let's say you see some cracks in it. And there, you know, you do, there are cracks. These are not the most visible people in Lebanon. Mm. They're actually, a lot of them are in hiding. They fear public rage. That's something that's new. But at the same time, it's about long-term reform. Yes. So would you be comfortable saying that the long-term ambitions still require a, a, res, a resolution to Lebanon's problems that are not Lebanese. Meaning, meaning, and there are whispers, there, there are whispers, sorry to interrupt, there's whispers, you hear Iranian-Saudi dialogue mm. happens now. Uh, or for that matter, there's... French-Iranian alignment. Thank you, I was <laughs> trying to find a way to say that doesn't sound, yes, French-Iranian mm. dialogue, or something that could be terrible to Lebanon. Russian-backed Assad, his role in Lebanon sort of comes back in a way that's familiar, where you see his allies back in power, which to me is the complete opposite, 180 degrees from Kaluna Irada. Yeah. So, yeah, as much as you, you know, can Ronnie, say. I yeah. think we've always, we've always waited for a solution to come from a regional compromise, from international powers. And I'm not saying that those powers aren't influential or that they mm. don't affect the way politics is being done in the country. I'm just saying that it is our duty also to create the right momentum in the country. And then we'd see how this right momentum in the country meets international and regional momentum. But at least it's up to us, I mean, today, if we even want to meet with international interlocutors, who would meet with them? Who represents the opposition? Right. We right. have to yeah. build something internally, and it's our duty to do this. Yeah. And then we manage this along with the international and regional dynamics, which are, of course, essential when we're talking about Lebanon. Yeah. But I appreciate that you're serving that role, which is hard, being the voice within Lebanon that other actors can speak to. So would you say that Kaluna Irada is comfortable in representing the opposition? I mean, we don't claim that we represent the opposition. Hmm. We have our own views. Hmm. Uh, many of the groups meet us on many of those views and positions. And by the way, we align very regularly on a lot of issues. And we're playing a role uh, that we think is essential and that other groups may not be able to or not be willing to play. And we think that it's important and uh, we'll take it to the end, of course, um, ethically and responsibly towards the Lebanese. I mean, from my own curiosity, is there a specific issue that opposition groups ask in terms of support? Are there stumbling blocks that they reach out to you for? Because I'm trying to understand really what, what they're struggling with, beyond that it's such a short period of time mm. to enter politics. But is it just in terms of the usual, the usual stuff that comes with elections? Is it sort of, is it budget issues? Is it campaigning, how to campaign? Is it marketing? I mean, how, what are they in need for when it comes to at least a group like Kaluna Irata? I mean, it's more of a partnership. It's not, uh, it's not a one-way. It's not uh, Kuluna Irada supporting certain groups. Mm, it's mm. more of a partnership between Kuluna Irada and several groups in the opposition. And there's a lot of policy development and alignment that takes place mm. uh, and discourse building. Uh, there's a lot of logistical um, uh, work and uh, coordination. There's a lot 
definitely of media and communication support. Okay. I mean, w- which is an obvious gap. Yeah. Uh, and definitely a, lo- a lot of funding is needed here. Mm. And I think that we shouldn't shy away from the fact that we have resources. Um, yeah. We're always in this attitude that uh, the political parties that are in power today have so much resources, have so much reach, have a great network. Well, I'll tell you something. The diaspora also has a great network and has a great reach and has a lot of funding. And today, wants a big chunk of this diaspora wants to support the opposition in Lebanon. Yeah. And we will also have the means and we will also use them and uh, we'll use everything we can to our advantage. It's nice to hear that you have these networks that go beyond Lebanon and that it's finally happening where the diaspora is, in a way, having this dialogue too. That it's not the regime that has its supporters outside. Opposition has its supporters outside. And there's a competition there. So I think it's, it's healthy to have a group like Kaluna Eirada standing firm on its principles and then working with opposition parties that are aligned. I'll wrap it up, Diana, with a question about you. Since you've been in this field for a few years now, are you reflective at what happened to Beirut Medinati during the Eustin crisis? And in a way, it's I wouldn't, want, I wouldn't use the word tragedy, but there was a big deflation with that whole movement and the fact that it, it just sort of, it ended without any footprint. You see it's yeah. still around now, but it's nothing like what it was six years ago. Do you sense that this time is different? Do you have, in a way, have you diminished your own expectations as a result? Just your own reflection, because I'd like... I like to hear from people that have been through this before. You know, I feel that uh, I really see it as a learning curve, mm. not personally, mm. but for the entire opposition. Yeah. We, you're talking about a landscape that was desertified for so long politically. Yeah. And, yeah. and you're talking about individuals who have ventured into this, not knowing even what to expect, right? Yeah. So there is this uh, learning curve. Um, And I think there are so many things that we've built up. There's a huge circle of trust that has been built among a a big chunk of the members of opposition. There's a lot of work that has been done already. Um, I mean, definitely, there's a real challenge, and we're learning, and we're building on it, but there's a real challenge in learning uh, how to work with each other and, (laughs) and... in applying the principles of democracy, really, we, we preach democracy, but we have to learn to, to also apply it internally. And by the way, this is one of the very impressive things about Kuluna Irada and one of the main reasons why I'm hanging in there. Um, this group of people, they know how to talk to each other. They know how to take decisions collectively, and they are able to abide by these decisions and this is something very rare <laughs> to see. And it's impressive. <laughs> really. <laughs> so it's basic communication functions within Kaluna Erado. <laughs> no, but really it's, 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 a, it's a board that is, that is able to take mm. decisions and decisions that are very decisive and that are uh, sometimes very politically sensitive. Yeah. But, but this is a group that has been coherent where members have stuck around even if the decisions weren't weren't to their liking, if these decisions were collectively taken and if democratically, uh, I mean, these were decisions that were taken democratically and they are able to respect this. And seeing democracy in practice like this was such a breath of fresh air for me, honestly. And it was impressive. And, and, it's and so, sorry, was that not the case with Beirut Medina? I, I always remember that it was a very democratic process, maybe to the detriment of the group. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not talking about Beirut Medinati mm-hmm. specifically. Yeah. I'm talking about all the groups in general. Right, I mean, right. Uh, yeah. There's a real challenge in, in being able to take decisions collectively without any vetoes mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. being able to, to move on, right? right. Um, but also, and, and going back to this uh, experience, um, I feel that um, today, in 2015 and 2016, we, we had the time and the luxury of going wrong or, or, or being right. But today, we have a greater responsibility yeah. as opposition. Yeah. The stakes are extremely high. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of 
demand from people to see something concrete, responsible, and solid. Yeah. Uh, and I think that this time, we also have to approach things differently. We also have to be very aware of the consequences of the collective decisions that we are ta- taking, and we have to um, and we have to deal with this responsibly. Um, we cannot be whimsical about this. Uh, we cannot be only theoretical about this. We have a responsibility. We have to be more pragmatic, and we have to weigh the consequences of our decisions and of our actions. Those are the kinds of lessons learned that you could only experience had you gone through something like Beirut Medinati. And it's important to note, it's a citywide campaign. It wasn't Lebanon. It wasn't mm-hmm. diaspora. It was really about Beirut. And now you have something that is global, Lebanese mm. all over the world, and the ones here. The splintering from people that should be more or less on the same page that are now forming different types of lobbying efforts. Is that for you okay, as long as the principles are intact? And I'll give you one specific example. It's not sort of, it's an obvious one. What is once a bigger Kuluna Irada is now a Nahwal Watan Kuluna Irada grouping, but they're more or less still advocating the same principles. Mm-hmm. So is that okay as long as everyone's on the, as long as the wider goals are shared? And you can have those minor differences that are not maybe that important at the end of the day. I think at the level of Kuluna Irada and Nahwal Watan, and also at the level of the different political groups, What's important is um, for the groups to realize that the stakes are very high, Mm. that very close coordination is required, Mm. that we have a common enemy, and that it's not time for us today to be toying with small and, and, and petty issues. Uh, the stakes are high. We have to be to remain focused. We have to know what our target is, and we have to head there, if not as one entity several entities, but together. So it's okay to have more than one in that sense, as long as the goal is shared. Yes, and as long as, and as, long as we don't uh, attack each other, right. and as long as we always remind ourselves uh, what the enemy is and mm-hmm. why we're here in the first place and why we're doing what we're doing. Well, for me, as somebody who's spoken to so many opposition members, some of their names more visible than others, and who's some, somebody who's attended many Kaluna Irata Zoom calls, <laughs> and someone who now gets to meet the managing director, and I'm friends with Albert Costanian, but it's nice to finally get to meet you. I, I appreciate that determination, not infringing on the principles, and I'm really glad that core issues are being discussed. And I know it started with sovereignty, I think the story will end with sovereignty because that is the big issue. Unaddressed, it's sort of left for decades now and it's finally being discussed every day. I'm glad to see it amplified by Kaluna Irada, by any group that's willing to talk about it, including yourself. So this is an honor for me. Uh, Thank you for the Kaluna Irada notebook, which comes with any discussion you have with Diana Menem. (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to keep this. I'll use it for my other episodes. And it's a real privilege. I'll ask you, Diana, just on your terms, is there anything that you would want a wider audience to know about Kuluna Irada that hasn't been said? I'm very impressed and honored to be in Kuluna Irada. This is a group of credible, ethical, dedicated, and capable individuals. Mm. I have a lot of hope. Uh, I feel that there is something that we can do in this landscape. I hope that we're going to be able to play our role to the fullest. And on a more personal note, I refuse to give up on this country. <laughs> and, uh, and for me today, being in Kuluna Irada is really me translating this into, into action. Yeah. Uh, I refuse to, to give up on this country. Um, I, I refuse to, to leave it for petty uh, uh, sectarian uh, leaders. I think that the country is the people who, who took their shovels and their brooms on August 5th and took away the dirt and cleaned the homes of people they don't know. It's not the people that, it, it's not the leaders that blew up. 
the city. The real country is those people. Um, I know that today refusing to give up is a luxury yeah. and not yeah. many people can afford. Yeah. As long as I can, and I hope I will be able to do it for, for long, um, I'm going to stay here. I refuse to leave the country to them. And I'm going to do everything I can to help build a country that resembles its people, not its leaders. Those are lovely words to end the episode with. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Thank you.